Today, we're exploring a topic that may be triggering to some listeners. While ketamine-assisted therapy can be a great option for treating depression, anxiety, OCD, PTSD, and even postpartum depression, this discussion may be triggering if you're struggling with substance use in the past. I want to make sure that everyone is prepared before we dive in. If there's even a chance that this topic could trigger you, skip it. We'll reconnect in the next episode. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Unboxed with me, Lana Seiler. And today I have with me Dr. Kathleen Daly, who is the medical director here at All Points North Lodge. She's a psychiatrist by training and one of my favorite people. Thanks. (laughs) Dr. Daly, um, we'll be on another episode that we're going to do a little bit later on about um, mental health issues and psychosis. And um, she's super talented in that area. So I'm really excited about that. Today, though, we're going to be talking about ketamine-assisted therapy and treatment. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. This is sort of new. I guess ketamine's been around for a long time, but using it for the purposes that we're exploring now, more of like a clinical psychiatric um, use is new. So ketamine... um, is it's a dissociative anesthetic and allergic and um mostly it's it's been used historically uh to help calm people down and to treat pain right yeah um, battlefield uh use in times of war and um in other circumstances where we would need to help someone settle and provide relief i guess is the best way to describe it and and you know sort of like these things happen um there's been, you know, we've noticed that ketamine has been helpful in other areas kind of accidentally. Mm-hmm. Much like many things in medicine. Yeah. <laughs> sort of accidental discoveries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of the history behind it. So it was developed as an anesthetic medication. It's still used as that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at lower doses then they used an they use an anesthesia as um, an analgesic medication for pain and chronic pain yeah um and there's kind of various anecdotes throughout history where they were administering it for um combat soldiers for example who had sustained injuries um in battle and they're literally pulling them off the field and giving them ketamine to help um, calm them down and relax them and also treat some of the pain while they get them transported. Um, and it just, there's sort of these self reports coming out about also their mood improved for days to weeks after receiving it. Yeah. Um, and so it was never intended to be a medication for depression or anxiety, but, um, I think enough of these sort of anecdotes and stories started coming out and then, um, and then it started to be researched yeah. for that. Yeah, and I, I keep reading about its effect on suicidal ideation too and sort of these anecdotal experiences of people getting ketamine for different reasons and and then having their suicidal ideation diminished or gone. Yeah, and so I think that's, that's the area we probably have the most evidence for because that's where a lot of the research started was very severe treatment-resistant depression um, and... They, there's numerous studies now looking at infusions of ketamine and pretty almost instantly taking away someone's suicidal ideation who'd been experiencing this for years. And um, at the time, I think a lot of the approval with the with research going on around it was given because it was really looked at as a life-saving measure. Yeah. Um, so the risks in that case kind of, or the benefits, excuse me, outweighed the risks um, associated with ketamine. Right, right. If we're looking at, you know, you're going to end your life, potentially, um, we can risk trying this Mm -hmm. to see if it helps. Yeah. Yeah, For these severe cases. I mean, I don't have a ton of misconceptions, except one of the things that I I, I hear a lot um, that I wanted to run by you to see what you think about it is sort of this idea of like a magic pill mm. or like a cure all, you know, mm-hmm. when we have these new, I was, we were doing another episode on, on different psychedelics for treatment. And, and I had this sort of the same question about this potentially being seen 
like a lot of things are when they first come out as you know a fail safe or a cure all and I imagine it's not that way what do you think about that yeah I mean I would I would say anything anything that comes out in in medicine and also other you know professions that sort of deemed this is this will be the answer Mm -hmm. um is pretty it's just dogmatic and not it's not it can't be the case and I and I also kind of I always say to kind of all of my clients and patients and just in discussing medications, supplements, sort of any kind of treatment we're doing, if it has efficacy, it's going to have side effects. You can't kind of, you can't get one without the other. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's just, you know, it's still something that should be approached with some caution. But, um, and I think it is relatively new in terms of the way that we're using it and it's becoming more widely accepted within psychiatry and medicine. But I think we are going to learn a lot more about it as well. We don't, we don't know everything and we don't know what we don't know. Right. And, and it's been around for a long time. So it's not like we don't know anything about the substance itself. Mm-hmm. We're just in kind of new territory with these different uses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so other, other misconceptions or thoughts, I guess, that are floating around out there about ketamine is, I mean, we know it's, it's a drug of abuse. People misuse it and it can be dangerous if it's misused. Um, so I'm wondering about people who have addiction in their histories. Um, and I guess with dosing and, um, like monitoring you when it's, when you're using it, it's different, but I still wonder about that. Mm -hmm. People who have those histories. So for, so for someone who has a severe, has a history of severe ketamine addiction, I that's this is not a medication that I would feel comfortable administering mm-hmm. um, or, you know, likewise, uh, history of really severe psychedelic addiction. So kind of the substances that are in that same realm. Um, but there are there is some research. There's actually a really interesting study that came out of England recently looking at ketamine for alcohol use disorder and mm-hmm. found some efficacy with that. Um, and. So, you know, there's sort of these clear, I think, indication or clear con- contraindications, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wouldn't across the board say if you have a history of substance abuse or addiction that it could be harmful. And I think it's it's re- you've really got to look at the whole picture and history um, because the other piece of this is that most of our, as you know, client and patient populations that have suffered with severe mental illness have also had issues with addiction to try to use that as a maladaptive coping mechanism for their depression that they has never been treated. Yeah, exactly. So, right. So the, the relief of the depressive symptoms and the, and the mental health symptoms could in, in a way by default help the addiction process mm-hmm. also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it a horse tranquilizer? <laughs> I guess technically it is. I'll have um, my sister in law is a vet. I should have asked her before this podcast. You need to call your sister in law and find out. Sure. Um, I, yes, it must be used in veterinary medicine. I would guess <laughs> as a um, as an anesthesia medication. Yeah. So extreme at really really high doses, ketamine is used in anesthesia. At sort of lower doses than that, it's been used for a longer period of time for pain Mm -hmm. and chronic pain. And then what we're finding is that kind of even lower doses than you use for pain is where we're seeing an antidepressant effect, which is interesting because it's the antidepressant effect does seem to be dose dependent and that more does not actually get you the antidepressant effect, if that makes sense. So people who have gotten ketamine for surgery to you know be put under don't have the same antidepressant effect as people that are getting it at lower doses um is it helpful for ptsd that so there's been more and more research being done um with that and it does seem to be potentially helpful for ptsd and anxiety disorders as well um what do we know sort of how that's happening? Like what's the mechanism? So what we know about ketamine is that, so it's, there's 
a receptor in the brain called the NMDA receptor, and it's antagonistic at that receptor. And the direct effects of that are to decrease um, the amount of glutamine in our brain and sort of this excitatory response that we have. And there's some indirect effects that occur as well. Um, And we think all of those, all of those things together leads to this antidepressant effect and also an anti-anxiolytic or anti-anxiety effect. Mm -hmm. Um, But it doesn't seem to be the whole, it can't be the whole picture, right? Because that's how it, it works. Just circling back to what I was describing, that's how it works at any dose. So why, then what, what is the dose dependency? How come more ketamine doesn't equal more antidepressive effect? It actually just does an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing we found or that's being found is that the antidepressant effect, um, as well as I think efficacy with trauma too, seems to be dependent on the dissociative experience while they're on ketamine. So if you don't get to that dissociative place, it doesn't work as well uh, for depression and anxiety. You know, I was reading kind of these questions about, is it purely the effect on our brain chemistry? There's also something about potentially like growing new synapses. Due to kind of all these indirect effects it has on different neurotransmitters, it it does... um, increase something called neuroplasticity which is basically just describes the brain's ability to create new connections Connections. like new neuronal connections Mm -hmm. which is what we're trying to do in therapy a lot of the time yes right we're trying to help people use less the connections that they've been using Mm -hmm. like i'm gonna go get high or whatever Mm -hmm. and use more new connections which is hard to do yeah when i describe for clients a lot of times i'm like it's kind of like you're walking in the forest and there's this clean trail <laughs> that you want to go down. And then there's this trail that you have to like pull out a machete and like hack your way through. And that's kind of what it feels like to be like using these new neuropathways. So it's interesting that that the ketamine has that effect. It can help that process, the plasticity process. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely, that seems pretty clear that it does increase neuroplasticity and that has something to do with, with its efficacy. Um, and so I think combined in conjunction with therapy, mm-hmm. The theory is that the ketamine session itself sort of sets that up in the brain, this like space for even more neuroplasticity. When you have therapy on top of that, it, it like expedites the therapeutic process. And so the dissociative piece, what I'm hearing you say is that that is an important component. It isn't just the effects on our neurochemistry and on our brain, it's also this experience that people have yes yeah and they I mean there's they've done a number of just different studies and um I I think a lot of the clinics who've been offering um or psychiatric providers who've been offering this for you know a decade or more have tracked outcomes and looked at these things it seems pretty clear that this dissociative experience does have something to do with it helping and do you know and I don't know if you know this but do you know what the qualities of those experiences are like is it is it sort of like hallucinating is it getting in touch with yourself it's very I think I think it's really varied Mm. um and it so I've heard in this training that I've completed um you know they they'll go through a lot of different case studies which has been really helpful and there's people who have recognized kind of buried memories from the past that they weren't consciously aware of. Um, People who've had sort of almost more like describing a more of like a spiritual sort of experience and journey. Um, Other people that this recognized sort of in that dissociative state, just everything felt more, their sensations just felt different or more intense. So I think it's a, it's a varied experience for people. Mm, interesting yeah um so being a dissociative my thought is you know and I guess what I'm hearing is people do remember but my thought is like are there gaps in memory I know that like sometimes people who are administering or utilizing ketamine treatment in facilities kind of just like hook someone up to ketamine and then like let them have their experience Mm -hmm. and like that's it Mm -hmm. um but I think I know we're going to do it differently here at APN. We're going to have um, a therapeutic protocol with it. Mm-hmm. 
So it being a dissociative, it it you people do remember the experience. Is that what I'm hearing? I think they remember. I think most people remember parts of it at least. Uh huh. Um, and I think sort of in line with how our memories work, as time goes on, you might remember less and less of it. I've mm-hmm. I've seen recommendations to like have a journal ready for afterwards or maybe even hours later because some most people are a little bit out of it coming out of it but trying to write down what you do remember to be able to process with a therapist afterwards Mm -hmm. and some people correct me if i'm wrong have the experience of of where they're kind of just quiet Mm -hmm. and just have this internal experience the whole time and they're not like talking to the to anybody they're just experiencing like almost like they're sleeping but they're not sleeping they're having this experience yeah and I think that's pretty common. Common, okay. yeah, that they're they're having their own internal experience. And the um, in the training, where they brought in um, some pr- experienced ketamine assisted therapy providers, um, it's interesting because so, for example, in talking about side effects, um, which, like I said. They're there. They're there. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, the most common side effect during that actual experience can be some nausea. And then you can have increased anxiety within that experience as well. And so we have a, you know, there's protocol set up for medications if needed. But it seemed pretty important to um, one therapist described, you know, so client says, I'm feeling really nauseous right now. And to actually encourage that person. So, like to go towards the nausea, see what comes out of that, see if you can tolerate it, let's actually stick with that. So almost like somatic work. Yeah, there's a lot of somatic work involved if you're having a provider there during the session as well. And it's, but it's very, you're sort of, it's not like a therapy, you're doing a therapy session Mm -hmm. (laughs) that you would normally. Mm -hmm. I think the provider's supposed to be kind of outside of that space a bit and let the client drive it, but be there for support. And then similarly with increased anxiety, it seems if the if the person's able to tolerate it to have them really kind of go towards that and see what it talk about what it feels like and if it's bringing up anything else for you. Yeah, almost like non avoidant. Mm -hmm. Like we're trying and we do this in therapy, too, especially in trauma work, right? We're trying to, you know, stay with that feeling, see what it has to say to you, you know, that kind of like what's there, explore it instead of what people tend to do, mm-hmm. which often gets us in more trouble than the actual feeling, is run from it yeah, or numb it out or medicate it or avoid it. Yeah. And it, so it was interesting because every ketamine clinic is going to have a protocol and medications on board just in case. And all of the providers that um, I've listened to or talked to who are really experienced in this have said, yes, and you add Ativan, which is an anti-anxiety medication, just in case in your protocol, but I've never used it. Mm-hmm. I've actually never used it, and I've been doing this. I've you know treated hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm-hmm. So it's, there's this sort of, I think if you select well for, you know, in terms of the patient, and then they're well supported in these sessions, it seems that having some anxiety come up actually just will be part of that therapeutic process. Right. It can be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Therapy can be uncomfortable anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Um, are there any other side effects or are there any, like anything to, is there anything to watch out for? I know you mentioned some contraindications. So it can, um, it can increase blood pressure. Um, so anyone that has uncontrolled hypertension or high blood pressure would not be a good candidate for this. I think it'd be kind of advised that they don't, um, anyone that's having actively psychotic symptoms, um, there's a contraindication there. A, a history of psychotic symptoms doesn't necessarily rule you out as mm. a candidate, but you'd want to be much more careful. So maybe you start with a smaller dose the first couple of sessions for that person and, you know, they're well monitored and supported and you're just kind of more aware that if they have a propensity for that, you need to be a little bit more vigilant. Afterwards. During. During. And after, yeah. Okay. Pregnancy? Pregnancies, no, yes, not recommended. Not recommended. Yeah. Okay. So walk us through, just from what you know, what does it look like to get ketamine treatment? What should someone expect? So there's different ways, actually, of administering ketamine. Um, so 
there's in, intranasal or like a nasal spray. Um, and S ketamine was FDA approved um, for major depressive disorder. Um, Spervato is the, the brand name of that medication. Um, so it can be administered that way. It can actually, it can be administered IV through an infusion. There's also, um, lozenges, um, as well as it being administered intramuscularly or subcutaneously, which is sort of a a shot. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there's different reasons that you might pick a different mode of administration for a person. Um, but the, the experience itself, it's, you know, best to kind of be in a, darker room low stimulation um oftentimes there's music but having kind of like music without any words or lyrics um you know something that wouldn't necessarily input like an emotional reaction or experience for people but just something more kind of calming soothing Mm -hmm. um i don't think this so there's there, I know there are a lot of places where you kind of show up and you just get ketamine and sit there for an hour or hour and a half or so yeah um I think that there's probably more that can a person would get out of it where there's some prep on the front end with a therapist or provider um something as simple as what are your goals for this and what is your intention and then reminding yourself of that intention before mm-hmm. the session starts um I think it just helps you know you get into a better space mentally. Um, and then, you know, usually people are sort of reclined or comfy chair, sort of, it's just supposed to be low stimulation and comfortable. Yeah. And then how long, like how many sessions do you need to do? Is it something that you just do like once for a few times and then you see the results or is it something that you do like every year? So so the typical is about is six to eight sessions over, three to four weeks usually um and the result and meet like immediately after is pretty robust I think one of the things that there's more and more research around is the longevity of that response so a lot of the studies that were done which is this is this is the way most studies are done with any medications actually it's sort of like a six to twelve week um, study and then that's it and then you don't actually it, it's just funny how we how we research things but <laughs> yeah you think <laughs> um and so in practice we're finding I th- I think it can be really transformative for some people but m- the majority of people might need another infusion every three to four months it doesn't have the longevity behind it yet yeah um we're, you know, at APN, what we're part of what we're talking about building out and having as part of the program in an ideal situation that it actually be paired with TMS as mm-hmm. well for depression. Yeah. Um, and the idea being there that it, ketamine works really well right away, but doesn't seem to have as much longevity with it. If it's if you kind of capitalize on that neuroplasticity that it creates has happens immediately and pair that with TMS will you actually see a longer response yeah. from it? Yeah, and TMS is transcranial uh, tra- yes. magnetic stimulation. Yes. And we're offering that at, at APN, and, and that's pretty common. There, TMS is all over the country at yeah. this point. I'd yeah. say it's, you can yeah. find it pretty much anywhere. One of the questions I had about ketamine is, like let's say you know we're seeing a patient out in an outpatient setting, and they have heard about ketamine and they want to do it and they do it at a clinic, um, A, can that provider maybe go and be with them? B, if you're working with somebody and they've done this, you know, can you, and maybe what are some good ways to like incorporate what's ha- what their experience has been into the work that you're already doing with someone? So I do know, I think it, it's probably dependent on the clinic, but I'm aware of um, a lot of ketamine clinics that are, have popped up in the Boulder Denver area um, that will allow like an outside provider or therapist to come in with their patient as a, a support person. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that that's, that seems to be entirely possible for people. Um, and yeah. And then if, so let's say my patient 
went and did a ketamine treatment without me or without a mm. therapist there. And then they're coming back to session um, and they do have memory of it. I mean, I, I would imagine this would be good sort of inroads and work to do. I know I don't know how long the neuroplasticity lasts. Yeah. Oh, so the there's actually a fair amount of evidence to show that having a psychotherapy session t- with like 24 to 48 hours after the ketamine session has the most oh. efficacy behind it. Um, yeah. And, and it must in some way capitalize on that neuroplasticity that's been created. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. So if our patients are interested, we can say like schedule, schedule your me. session. Yeah, yeah. Right after. Yeah. I would say not the day of though. <laughs> so most people, I think when they're, they come out of it and leave that day. I mean, they're told, we're to- told to rest, mm-hmm. plan on a pretty chill day. You're going to feel sort of out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the following day or, you know, two days after seems yeah. to be that sweet spot. That's good to know. So um, just some takeaways from this episode, because I know we've gotten into quite a bit and there's more to get into and maybe we'll do a part two also. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm really excited about our, our next one on, on, um, psychosis. Uh, so I'm thinking, um, how this is new. How do you find a reputable clinic? How do you find a reputable provider? Is there a website? Do you know of, how do you navigate it? Yeah. So I, cause I think there's a lot, a lot popping up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, we all, we all start with the internet. <laughs> Um, I, but I would maybe do a little bit of research. How long has that facility clinic been there? Um, uh, the credentials behind it. If you're going for mental health reasons, it might want to, and you have choices and options. You may prefer to go somewhere that's being run by psychiatrists and psychiatric providers. Um, there's ketamine clinics focused more on pain that are, um, generally, uh, being delivered by anesthesiologists. Um, and, but then that's not to say that there isn't an anesthesiology run clinic there where they've hired psychotherapists as well. So, um, I think if I think, I think having psychotherapy paired with this in some capacity seems to be really important, um, for it to be efficacious and, and, and that for you to get more of that longevity in terms of that antidepressant effect. Yeah. So whether that's going somewhere where they offer that, um, along with the infusions or allow you to bring a therapist that you've established a relationship with and is had maybe has some experience training with it or is open to it as well. So is, th- is there like a certification or anything like is, can clinics be like uh, get this? Some sort I don't, of there's not a license, I, you know, around it or certification. So there's okay. definitely trainings being offered. I'm, I've done mine with the integrative psychiatric Institute um, and they have their own clinics in the Boulder area, um, but they're a very reputable organization. Um, and then there's, I gotta, we'll come back to it. Remember the name. There's one in California. <laughs> it's okay. There's yeah. 20 in California. <laughs> there, there's a training institute like in California yeah. as well. So maybe um, find so. a clinic that's sort of aligned with some sort of training institute. Yeah. Right. As we're, and, and if you're going for, psychotherapeutic reasons find a place that's doing it for those reasons yeah. rather than like a pain clinic that sort yeah. of a thing um and then and i don't know if there's an answer for this but another takeaway kind of popping around in my mind is you know this is again this is sort of new it might be a little controversial mm-hmm. um and you know if you've been working if someone's been working with a clinician for a long time and that clinician maybe has some bias or struggles with the idea of ketamine um especially since you know we hear of it as a street drug and we hear of it as like you know the overdoses and all this stuff um i I just want to validate for people that that might be a barrier right that might be some yeah some struggle around finding you know somebody who's willing to go down this road yeah 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 like most new things right yeah no there's still a fair amount of skepticism and I mean some of it's 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 good healthy skepticism in some ways yeah sure um it's not a benign medication um or drug so um I think it's good that providers are are have having that skepticism around it um it seems there seems to be if enough evidence at this point that I think it's worth exploring for some people who 
have really struggled with years and years of severe depression who've had multiple medication trials and they don't work or they stopped working. Um, it, you know, I think it, it could be the right thing for them. And I want to validate too that we do hear a lot of like fad stuff that comes out um, in our field. And I want to validate that it, it, it is responsible to like take a minute and breathe and think about it and mm-hmm. read about it. Um, and also kind of to what your, your point is about the right candidate, there may be a lot, there may be like some excitement around this is going to fix me. Yeah. And, and so people may be trying to go down that road if it's, even if it's not the best thing for them. Yeah. So I just want to, yeah, point out those like realistic yeah, sort I, of I parameters. Yeah, I think it still is going to involve some hard work. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the misconceptions on out there sort of for the positive side is that it's just going to cure everything and you're going to have this life-changing experience and then go on your way and that'll be that. Yeah. And that, I, yeah, there's, there's more to it than that. Yes. Um, therapy can be tedious change can be <laughs> tedious yeah <laughs> there's no way around it well this has been really wonderful thank you so much for coming on and i'm excited to to have more conversations yeah with thanks you. for having me yeah awesome Thanks again, Dr. Daly, for being with me here today. It was really um, exciting and informative, um, and I'm looking forward to new ventures together at APN down the ketamine trail. If you want any more information on this topic, feel free to email us at pod at apnlodge.com. That's P-O-D at apnlodge.com. And for more information, you can also visit us at our website, apn.com slash podcasts. Don't forget to tune in to the next episode. Feel free to like, share, and thank you so much for joining.